Sounds good. Hi there. I want to welcome everybody. I've just gone live. There we go. There's my live indicator. I want to welcome everybody to today's session as part of our uh, five part series for the modern workplace transformation. Today's session is on protecting high risk healthcare and life sciences data with identity and conditional access. To be clear, though, if you're even not if you're not a healthcare customer, um, but just interested in protecting your data with identity and conditional access, this is equally applicable to you, right? So uh, originally, I'm going to go ahead and share um, a little view here. Originally, uh, today, we were going to have Alex Weinert. However, we're really lucky because um, Alex was double booked, but we've got a phenomenal speaker today. So Tarek Daoud is with us today, and he is going to be talking to us about conditional access, um, identity, and then all the ways how that protects our data. As a couple of housekeeping items very quickly, um, I'm gonna go back to my little uh, face here so you can see me pointing. A um, Couple of housekeeping items just to uh, bring up is, and I'm queuing that up. If you look in your upper right-hand corner, I hope that's pointing to your right-hand corner of your browser, there is a little dialog box with a question mark. If you click that open, that is the live event Q&A box. We love to hear from you. We want to take your questions. I'll be moderating and grabbing those. I'll be dumping your questions into a OneNote so that as we stop and have Q&A, we can tee those up. This is your time. We want you to get your questions answered. We also love to hear shout outs. So if you want to say hello and where you're uh, watching us from, you know, I've had people from Germany, Brazil, et cetera. I had uh, London yes yesterday. We'd love to hear from you, so give us a little shout out. But the little live Q&A box, again, in the upper right-hand corner, little dialog box with a question mark, click on that. Then you can post your questions, your shout outs, et cetera. Love to hear from you. So without further ado, we've got Tarek here. And Tarek, did you want to share your desktop and introduce yourself? Um, sure thing, Mike. Thank you very much much. Um, hi everyone, my name is uh, Tarek Daoud. I am a um, program manager with um, the identity division. I actually am the lead architect in the customer success team that is a part of our identity division that works directly with customers to try and get them um, deployed and successful with uh, identity in Azure Active Directory. And um, we're going to be talking today about what it's going to take to make the transition to the cloud and to identity um, in the cloud and focusing specifically on our um, the heart of our um, technology stack, which is the um, conditional access engine and how it helps you protect your apps and protect access to your apps in modern ways. And uh, we'll, we'll try and um, keep an eye on the health sector specifically and their needs um, uh, as we're talking through this. But um, this, as, as Mike said, this is applies to um, just about everybody. Um, as, the, as you can see from the first slide, <laughs> digital transformation is happening um, across the industry and um, a lot of, in, in the old happier world, um, you had on-premises, you put everything, you put a nice little neat boundary, around everything and you were um, in a good shape. And then, of course, the first thing that left your enterprise um, was the, um, I, can, I can animate the slides to make it better. So um, the first thing that left your enterprise, you know, was the uh, apps, the data. It actually left before everything else. With, as you started using SaaS, uh, the successful uh, many SaaS apps, including our own Office 365, there's, you know, Azure, AWS, Salesforce, um, so while a lot of enterprises were still putting things like, oh, you can only access from inside corporate, but well, the data itself left, right? Um, next thing that actually walked out the door was the devices. People started using smarter devices uh, other than the corporate laptop or the corporate desktop that you gave them to access the data. So now the device is outside the network and the data is outside the network and the network is becoming 
more and more meaningless. And then the third thing is identities. People uh, started coming in with other identities. The notion of collaboration software. Now that you are using Office 365 and the other customers using Office 365, well, why don't we collaborate with those identities together inside Office 365? Um, people came in with their Google identities, with their social IDs, with their ping identities, and now how do we, um, so not every identity in your ecosystem was started and incepted from your directory, nor were they all coming with credentials you owned. And in fact, if we learned anything over the past five years is that those who tried to solve it by giving those users new credentials in their directory suffered um, um, significantly. Um, so uh, that, and then of course there's IoT devices now that as you start having uh, uh, intelligent cloud, intelligent edge, um, there's more and more devices coming into the system that are not just uh, end user devices. And how do you tie all these things together? We think that the, a good, you can do this, which is a mishmash of things, or we think that the, the common identifier between all these things is the identity platform, the authentication stack that can um, uh, also, and, and authorization that can help kind of give you a central view to who's going to what. So. Um, this is where we believe um, Azure Active Directory fits and we think it addresses your needs. Consumer apps, enterprise apps, um, um, what do you call it, devices that Microsoft makes, devices that other people make. We try to make our stack extend to just about um, uh, everything. We're, Azure Active Directory is an open standards based uh, directory. It is not something proprietary. Uh, it does not use any main proprietary things that Microsoft makes. We are not simply following OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. We're actively participating in them. Um, some of the specs written for some of the OAuth standards and OpenID standards are written by folks at Microsoft currently in the division. Um, we are a contributor to the FIDO Alliance and to the specs, uh, the WebAuth and spec and so on. Skim, we're a big contributor to it. So um, we're really trying to um, make sure that our identity stack, if we are going to be the central control plane for your needs, we have to um, play by the standards rules. We cannot, uh, we recognize that very clearly that we can't just have our own thing and we can't just say, oh, well, this standard is not good enough. We'll just make our own. We have to work within the standards community to improve the standard and so on. Um, just real quick, some uh, high level numbers. Um, we have 17.5 million organizations in Azure Active Directory. We have 1.1 billion identities that our division is responsible for, about 800 plus million active consumer identities that our division also takes care of, and 200 plus million um, enterprise identities, uh, which is Azure Active Directory, uh, uh, serving all the Microsoft first party apps as well as third party apps. As you can see in the third box, uh, Azure Active Directory is not just a Microsoft thing that works with you know, Office and Azure. There's seven customers have used, have configured 732,000 unique third party apps in Azure Active Directory, apps that do not go to any Microsoft URL. But they use single sign on with us to benefit from this central control plan we're going to talk about. Uh, there are 90,000 paid Azure Active Directory customers between EMS, AD Premium One, and so on. There's 8 billion Azure Active Directory authentications a day. Um, and this matters in a bit when we talk about uh, the conditional access uh, risk assessment and machine learning stuff, because um, the volume of um, the training data set you see does make a big difference in how um, uh, clever and realistic your machine learning algorithm is going to be. And finally, 90% of Fortune 500 companies um, uh, use Azure Active Directory, and this is as of last month. So, um, as we mentioned, 200 million um, active, unique active, monthly unique active users in Azure Active Directory. Um, it gives you the comfort and the credibility that um, this is not some um, small scale thing. It's not simply, uh, as I mentioned, it's a true cloud, multi-tenant cloud service. So it's not simply that we, you don't get your own installation of Azure Active Directory. It's actually uh, for everyone. Um, uh, we've had recently, we announced in uh, Ignite, we had uh, Walmart talk about their journey. This is just to show the scale of Azure Active Directory. Then Walmart had two plus million uh, employees that they were trying to move to the cloud. 
and they moved into Azure after that. Because our scale is this big, someone like Walmart is only 1% of our user base. It's not like, oh, we've never seen this volume and we've never seen this amount of... Uh, so our ability to scale is well proven. And they have all the, you know all these thousands of apps and thousands of users on the platform. Um, you mentioned the plethora of apps. I don't want to belabor that point. So um, this is kind of showing how we're trying to also, as as Microsoft, we're trying to in order for us to be the central control plane. We can't be exclusionary. We can't shut people out of our platform, right? And so, for example, the first set of connectors shows you that these are the types of um, uh, apps that federate with us. The second set of connectors shows that these are the types of um, provisioning like skim connectors where we actually reach out to the app and write the identities, and the user profiles in the app. Um, the third party apps that are integrated with us right now as a third collection. So this is just showing that we're trying to build a rich ecosystem where everybody wins, uh, our, you know, uh, other software companies and not simply, uh, you know, Microsoft wins and everybody else wins. We're actually trying to uh, enrich. And I think we have a responsibility to kind of um, bring customers to the cloud and vendors to the cloud and identity providers to the cloud and um, help everybody get there because of the transitional moment we're in right now. Um, so right now, Azure Active Directory is able to connect to your, we're hoping, you know, across your different, uh, the different aspects of a digital estate. We connect to your on-premises system uh, with AD or even uh, LDAP directories, we can sync from them. We, we connect to your on-premises authentication service. So if you have ping federate, if you have ADFS, uh, we also offer you the fact that we can authenticate you directly in the cloud. We can also bring the authentication back to your on-premises systems. We integrate with the Windows platforms. We have integration with Mac and iOS, and we have integrations with Android. Uh, we integrate with SaaS apps that we make and others make, and as well as the Microsoft First Party Cloud. So we are trying real hard to be to meet customers where they are, rather than simply um, um, where it was convenient for Microsoft. Um, I'm going to move ahead to the conditional access part because I do believe um, this is kind of talking about the types of app and how we integrate with apps on premises, apps in the cloud. But I think I have um, made that point a few times. So I'm just going to move ahead to um, uh, another point, which is how seriously we take our role. Uh, our role is not simply to um, have a solution that oh makes money for Microsoft. Our role is we 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 believe is to help this whole digital transformation happening in the industry, and so we take our role as a as a leading identity provider very seriously, including the fact that we contribute to the standards, because um, we're trying to kind of lead where the industry should go. So one of those areas when we can talk about it uh, uh, in more detail is how we're leading the drive towards passwordless, right? We're trying to get to world class security where. We believe passwords are horrible and passwords are nobody likes passwords except you know hackers the users don't like them because they forget them all the time but they're just easy to recover and reset that's why everybody uses them but not because everybody enjoys using them and they're um very um harmful from a security perspective because they're a secret that works everywhere and it's easy to guess and uh, it's easy to steal and easy to fish and all that stuff so we're actually leading the drive of passwordless we're re leading in uh we're in the FIDO Alliance. Windows 10 is one of the um, earliest adopters of FIDO-like authentication uh, with Windows Hello for Business. Uh, we're doing a uh, web authentication integration in the early, in the current insider build of Windows, and you can see it uh, was basically where the browser can finish a FIDO authentication for you. And we're releasing also in the spring coming soon this year is the um, ability of Windows 10 to actually authenticate you from the lock screen you know first time you log into windows 10 you can log in with the fido device straight up and not even have to type a password we're already pushing password lists on the on the properties we control which is the consumer side we're pushing it fairly aggressively to where very soon if you create an msn account or an outlook.com account you won't have to even have an initial password like your first pass your first sign-in method is going to be phone sign-in 
you won't even have a password in the system altogether. So we believe we're, we're kind of driving to the fact that we, you're not truly passwordless until there's no password for you in the system, not just uh, that's the fact that you don't use your password on a regular basis. And so we're trying to kind of get to passwordless uh, on many, many fronts, on the device front, on the OS front, and the STS, you know, the cloud service front. Uh, and we're pushing across all this because we genuinely believe that is what's best in the best interest of the consumers and uh, the, you know, your, your employees in your organization. And so um, this is part of how seriously we take our role. It's not simply, oh, we're going to do the convenient thing. Everybody has passwords today, so let's just keep you know, inventing all kinds of ways to reset your password. We're really pushing hard and investing a lot of engineers and uh, architects into how do we get to passwordless. Um, so, hey, Tarek. Hey, Tarek. Yes, sir. We had a question um, on the conditional access piece mm -hmm. around uh, are there conditional access features that help work for shared workstation scenarios? And they specifically brought up the one that we get hit with all the time is around nurses' workstations, where it's a shared one. Do you have anything to speak to that? Um, sure. Let me actually get to the conditional access slide and then go back. So the question came two slides early. Um, here's <laughs> slide. um, so for shared kiosks as a scenario, um, there are a couple of things we're doing and a couple of things and still a couple of problems we have to solve. So for the, um, the for the kiosk scenario, there are right now, um, there, uh, I'm curious actually for the person who's asking the question, which one they follow. So we've seen um, the kiosk scenario in the, uh, what do you call it? The, in the retail business, it's usually actually somebody, there's a logged in machine that has no, um, no identity that's in the cloud. It's just logged into the corporate network or just logged in just to get internet access. And then the employees walk up, double click on the browser and the browser is set to, or by default go home pages, you know, my apps at Microsoft.com or whatever. When they go there, they're asked to authenticate, and then the person types in their username and password, or and gets in, checks their you know uh, benefits or whatever, and then walk away. That's one mode we've seen. Another mode we've seen is no, there's login and logout of the works, the kiosk station itself, and then the third mode we've seen, especially in healthcare, is with Improvada, where basically you're not actually switching in the Windows um, OS itself. You're still logged in with one identity. But you simply wipe a badge or swipe your badge on something, and in provider actually, uh, as one provider, for example, um, switches on contexts uh, underneath Windows. So it's not actually in Windows that the context is happening. Um, and we are um, the first one is is doable right now, and the retail one it works fairly well. The, we have lots of success stories in retail. I mentioned Walmart. There are other customers who are um, uh, happy with that one. But with the um, the other two, where the uh, the first one, the second one, where the the OS logs out and logs in again, the Windows team is doing work. I, I think of the scenario as more uh, what do you call it? The, um, you go to a retail store and they're gonna walk around with a tablet, say like the AT&T store or the Comcast store, and the store worker comes up to you with a tablet or a, something like that. And in this case, those tablets are like 20, but the people who work in the store are 50. And so each one, you know, after the, the beginning of the shift, they just pick up a tablet and then log in. And it can't take that person five minutes just to get to pass the user profile setup thingy and get in. <clears throat> and so um, in that scenario, the Windows team is doing actually some good investments there to make it faster. And with the FIDO work we're doing, it's going to be very easy for them to simply log in first time with the FIDO credential. And then after that, set up Windows Hello for Business. And uh, But if they don't want to set up, they can just keep using the FIDO device to switch between different, um, what do you call it, different uh, tablets. In the third one, the case with Improvada, um, we don't have something um, happy and you know, smooth right now, but we're trying to investigate that one with Improvada-like uh, vendors to see if we can make it such that um, you can somehow control the different sessions uh, and apply different restrictions. So we can say, for example, if a doctor comes in, I want it to be I don't know, strong off, but if it's a nurse, then not. Or if it's a doctor after hours, then maybe apply this extra control uh, versus if it's during the day hours. Um, so 
because the identities that Azure, the identities are the identity switching is happening inside <coughs> Windows. Um, we're not quite there yet, but we're looking into it. And I want to use this opportunity to actually go kind of back to and explain conditional access to the rest of the audience who are not very familiar. That's why I came up to the slide. So our conditional access engine is basically um, uh, this uh, beautiful diagram keeps growing bigger and bigger every time. But basically, it's a, you can think of it as a set of conditions coming in and a set of controls coming out. And the conditions are basically the the factors around the authentication that we should look at. So think of it as who's the user, what group membership they have, what roles they have. Um, um, you can look at the device state they're coming in from. You can look at um, the location, network location, or geographical location. Those both are available in condition access right now. Um, you can look at the type of uh, client app that's being used. Is it a browser? Is it a rich client? Is it a um, mail client of some sort? And then you can also look at the authentication methods. We also factor in risk. So that's something you can't tell us what the risk is. We actually can evaluate the session of the risk and kind of make a judgment call based on looking at the history of the user. We can make we build a profile for what the user looks like. And if that profile looks significantly different on a single on a specific login or a collection of logins, we, we raise the risk of the session or the risk of the user and say this user looks like they're in a risky situation. There's a there's a higher chance that they're not who they say they are, even if the, even though they provided the right credentials. So as we said, passwords as a credential is not the you know the be all end all of credentials. It's actually a fairly weak credential. So um, just because someone provides the right password, that does not give us a lot of comfort. And then on the other side of the circle, you see is the controls is what happens when all these conditions are met or not met. Right, so we decide. Okay, if the if if, if the person is you know from this role, from this group, coming from this type of device, block or allow, or um, require a higher authentication, like require force an MFA, force a password uh, reset, or um, the fairly newer thing that I think also applies significantly to healthcare is the limited access part, where you can say, okay, if you're coming from your usual machine, from your usual identity, from your usual conditions, you know, you're coming from the corporate network. You're coming on a domain join machine. Just go ahead, go to SharePoint, do whatever you want. It's fine. But if you're in a hotel kiosk and you're temporarily accessing a link that somebody told you, hey, you need to respond to this thing right away, and you need to go to SharePoint to look at whatever it is they want you to look at. And so you go to the hotel kiosk, you go to portaloffice.com, you click on your SharePoint sites to go look at that thing. We don't want you to accidentally click on download and leave a cache copy on the hotel kiosk. So what we can we have what we can do with conditional access is we can send a signal to SharePoint that say this guy is not coming from these conditions, he's coming from these other conditions. Can you please give them a limited session? And what SharePoint can do on their side is they will actually say, okay, for this site collection, if you see this limited session flag coming from Azure AD, then don't allow them to download, don't allow them to make changes, just allow them to read. Don't allow them to print, you can say. You can just you can say just you can only look at it on the browser, that's it. And I think that's mad that matters in terms of things like uh, patient privacy data. You don't want to have accidentally someone leave patient data on a hotel kiosk somewhere or a internet kiosk somewhere in the airport. In the airport. So I think that's a fairly useful feature for uh, for that type of industry. The other thing you can do is you can integrate it with cloud app security. So you can actually say um, it's a cloud app security is a, is a security offering from uh, Microsoft that basically scans activity within this. Uh, SaaS apps, and obviously it has a very good handle on Microsoft SaaS apps, so SharePoint and Exchange. So you can also have Cloud App Security monitor that session more closely and do things like, you know, but prevent all writes. So just allow them to do all the get verbs, but they can't do any put post patch. They can't do changes, just allow them to um, do reads but not writes while they're in a restricted session. So this way you give your end users and your doctors or your um, administrators in the hospital, more flexibility. They can do more work while they're on the road, while they're in different conditions, while they're on a home PC. But at the same time, you're not compromising on uh, no data should not be left accidentally on somebody's grandmother's machine while they're on Christmas visiting her or something like that uh, by having these limited sessions. So, um, and you and those controls apply equally to Microsoft apps, to third-party SaaS apps, as well as to on-premises apps that you publish with our 
um, a proxy technology. Um, so I want to, um, if there are no questions on this area, I wanted to actually cover yeah. the- Yeah, we actually, so what? Tarek, we actually had a couple of questions. Go for it. Um, so the, let's see, da, 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 the first that I have here, um, one was, well, this first one, they had a question around AADCA rules planning. And is Excel matrix available with all conditions? Um, yes. Um, I mean, I'm not sure how what good it would help to have a full Excel sheet, but yes, there is. Um, um, I guess we can provide or build one, but I do want to actually state a few things that are important to remember when you're doing CA. The first one is um, Azure Active Directory by default will not apply CA unless you tell us to apply CA. So this is kind of a paradigm shift from on-premises where if somebody doesn't come up to you and say, hey, can you set up this SPN for me for Kerberos, then an app doesn't get single sign-on with, with AD, um, yeah, at least if you're doing Kerberos, right? Um, in the cloud, if you configure a SaaS app in your tenant, just create the SaaS app, and assign five users to it. There is no CA involved at that point. It's simply authentication. We're going to authenticate the user. We're going to do an access check to see if the user is assigned or not. If they're not assigned, we will give them a you're not assigned error. If they're assigned, we'll let them in. And that's the end of that. The conditional access, you actually have to go create a policy, put the application in scope for Azure need to start um, restricting access to that app. So that's the first thing that people need to be mindful of, is that if you don't create policies for your apps, then your apps will skip CA by default. You should be aware of that. It's just a paradigm shift that you should be aware of. Some people say, well, I'm going to create a policy that says all apps that, uh, yeah, a fallback policy that says, you know, block all. If, if you do that, you're going to actually fairly hurt yourself right now. It needs a because um, there are many apps that are, many Microsoft first party apps, for example, that are, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, um, not necessarily known to you, that actually may be blocked as a result of that. So for example, you may actually cause breaking sign in to Azure something because it silently calls into Azure AD and because of your block policy, you did not create an exception rule for that app. So blocks it by accident, and now half your devs are not able to check in stuff. So you have to be careful with the block all kind of approach. So right now, my recommendation is the opposite, which is simply have a process that says every time I'm adding an app, I'm going to make sure to have a chat with the owners of it, figure out what kind of controls you want to put on it, you know, require MFA, require trusted device, restricted session, whatever. A lot of times your own app Owners don't know these things. You, you want to give them options. They may not know. Most app owners, if you tell them, hey, I want to put MFA on the app, they'll be like, you know, why? Go away. You're, gonna, you're getting in my way, right? You're going to have to come to them with a you know, compliance perspective. What kind of data is in this app and so on. But rather than come with a stick, you can also come with a carrot that says, if we have this discussion around what type of data is in the app and uh, what controls should be on the data, I can give you more ways of getting to the data. Right. I can give you read-only access when you're in the airport. I can give you this, but let's talk about it, right? Um, so just be aware of, of how conditional access works. So that's the first thing is, um, and then uh, is is the is the fact that CA is not there unless you put it there. You you have to involve conditional access by going to Azure Active Directory, con security, conditional access tab, and that's, um, and setting up a policy that targets this specific app. Um, uh, and so what this means is the absence of a policy means allow, right? So for example, if you have a policy that says, um, when you're coming to this app from iOS, require compliant device. Sounds good. What happens if you come from Android? You are not required to have a compliant device. You follow? So you got to make sure that you never use the conditions. This is the left side here, these conditions. Never use these as a way to allow to implement or not implement security. You use them as a way to, to decide what security method to apply. You don't use them as a way to say, oh, I'm going to have security or I'm not going to have security. What I mean by that is you, if you have a policy that says, for example, if you're coming from Windows, require domain join. 
then you should have a second policy that says, and if you're coming from iOS and Android, then require compliant device with Intune, for example. You shouldn't just say, oh, and if you're not coming from Windows, nothing, because then if people coming from mobile will just come in, right? So people just work around your uh, policy by coming from a different platform. Same thing if you say, oh, if you're coming from corporate network, then require X, or if you're coming off corporate, then require X. As you know, the whole industry now is shifting to zero trust networks, right? Where um, everybody's trying to move off of this whole dependency on corporate network as a safe zone. Um, so we do, we agree with this strongly and conditional access is the way to implement zero trust networks within Azure AD. And so what we recommend is if you're going to have something that says if you're inside, if you're off corp, then, then you know, require this level of assurance, then you should also have something that says if you're inside corp, require this level of assurance. I don't know, domain join or um, MFA or something else or factoring risk. Don't just say if you're inside corp, then carte blanche, password is good enough, right? So um, that's the second thing is um, when you're using these conditions, use them to target the controls. Don't use them to skip or keep controls. Um, and then as a side note, it, uh, we have a session um, <coughs> in Ignite. We talked about it at Ignite, myself and, our, and a teammate called Sean Ivey. We presented at Ignite about the, uh, and I can provide the link after the, the show, <coughs> presented a session about hybrid domain join. The fact that your machines are domain joined can be used in the cloud with a little config. It takes like you know 10 minutes to set up. Maybe it takes an hour to verify that it's properly set up and tested you know, on various machines, Win 7, Win 8, Win 10, but it is highly beneficial. So make sure you make use of the fact that you've done that work already. You're you're investing heavily in, an, in you know, some domain joint technology and some domain joint infrastructure and SCC and all that stuff. Benefit from that in the cloud and use it as a control. And um, don't just be MFA only. There are other ways of doing it. Um, and then um, finally, uh, play around with conditional access and play around with how it manifests in the sign-in logs. Understand how to read the sign-in logs. Uh, we, in every sign-in event, we actually log <coughs> what conditional access policies were evaluated or not. So make sure to look at the sign-in logs and experiment with them as you're setting it up so that you find and 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 learn how to debug why someone is being blocked or not or not being blocked by a CA policy. You had excellent. We had a couple of others if you wanted to take them. Go for it. Yeah, so um the next one and some of these I think will be pretty quick. The next one was when do you think Microsoft will go to password less? for AD and O365. Hmm. Do you mean Microsoft itself or its own employees? Or, or I, I think AD? they're talking about, you know, because we keep talking publicly about how we're trying to move to a password list. Uh, and I don't know that there's any firm timing. I think it's more vision and direction, but I'll let you. Well, so I think Microsoft, it's, so that's, there are two, way, two ways of looking at it. Microsoft itself and then the world. So in Microsoft, we're trying to get to passwordless. Um, we've been actually for the last two years. So for those who don't know us internally, um, we hardly ever use our passwords. Now Windows Hello for Business is required and everybody's configured for it for like two years now. And I personally have a very hard time remembering my password because we also, uh, we worked with, uh, as, as some of your listeners may know, we worked with NIST so two years ago in 2016, we published a password guidance that's from us, from Microsoft. Um, I can send you the link after the show that says, you know what, we've been running consumer service for, you know, when did we buy Hotmail, like uh, 2000 or 99 or 98, whatever, um, for a long time. And uh, we've learned a few things. And um, most of the major consumer running services also reach similar conclusions. So one of the conclusions, for example, we reached is that some of these tried and true um, uh, principles of security were not very modern and were not proven out by time. What I mean by that is the age old wisdom that you ask the user for their username and password in the same window, and then you tell, don't tell them which one failed. You just tell them your username or password is incorrect, right? You know, something very, an ancient you know, concept and principle long upheld by security experts. Running our service for 10 years plus, we discovered that's not very helpful. We found out that the bad guys can tell the differences in the response time. 
and you know milliseconds. They can tell the difference in milliseconds difference between the server response time when the username is correct versus when the password is correct. Uh, or sorry, when the username is incorrect versus the password. However, the ones who can't are the end users who really are confused about whether it's username or password. And so all it did was raise our support costs. Everybody was calling saying, hey, I don't remember my username. Hey, I don't remember my password. Oh, no, sir, your password is fine, but it's actually, you're not this, you're not Bob at Hotmail, you're Rob at Hotmail. Oh, okay. So based on that, we um, decided, like I think it was a year and a half, two years ago, to break username and password acqu acquisition, to ask you for your username first, and then tell you if the username is right or wrong, and then next, tell you the password, ask you for the password. Um, and you notice that Google did the same thing. Right, and we just both of us just went against the security expert recommendations because you know what, talking to each other, us and them were like, this is not working, is it? No, it's not. So same thing with the uh, password guidance. We published a guidance two years ago that says, you know what, this age old wisdom of have no less than 12 characters with four character sets and make it expire every 30 days or 60 or 70 days. This stuff doesn't work. Um, we found mathematically, we proven mathematically research with uh, Microsoft, with the help of Microsoft research, that it is actually easier on the bad guys to do, to actually uh, run um, guessing functions against that one because humans are predictable, not because math has a problem, right? Humans, if you sit in a room with a bunch of you know average folks and you tell them, okay, your work password most likely has a capital letter at the beginning. A bunch of small characters, and then the numbers are at the end, and the symbols are after the numbers. You know, the exclamation marks or the whatever are after them, or the question marks are after the numbers. That the profile of like 90 people, 90 percent of the people who are subjected to a password complexity of four and 12 characters, and the seasonality of you know 70 or 60. Most likely, they're going to put a, a season or something like that in their number at the end of their password, so that they can keep rotating the number in a predictable way. All that is known and well known in the hacker industry. So we were all pretending to have a more a safer password pattern when it wasn't. So we, you know, uh, challenged all that, published a white paper about it, and then a the year later, NIST similarly arrived to uh, uh, very similar conclusions that it is better to simply have a minimum of eight, so that you have you know good entropy. It's not too easy, not three character, and then simply more more important than having all these complex character sets and all that stuff is actually block well-known bad passwords. So block the word password. Block, uh, what do you call it? Hello, welcome, <laughs> enter. These amazing passwords that people come up with. Um, if you are a famous um, brand, if you are the Lakers, then block, you know, Kobe Bryant or LeBron James as a password. If you're, <laughs> you know, like a car maker, if you're, you know, Ford, then, you know, a Mustang might be a common password in your environment. And uh, Porsche and some other, you know, environment and so on. So make sure that you block these bad passwords that are industry known and we actually have, given that we're a big identity provider ourselves, we know what the top bad passwords are because everybody keeps trying to use them on our system and the bad guys keep trying to use them against us, right? And uh, we have our own list and we block that in our service. So if you try to, actually, if your users try to set, you know, famous infamous password one, two, three, or if they try to set their password to their username, we will block that stuff. But also, we give you a feature that allows you to block bad passwords um, that are specific to your environment. So if you're a famous uh, car company, you can block Mustang and Corolla. If you're a famous uh, you know, basketball team, then you can block you know, Magic Johnson and so on. So that you can basically also customize them. So this is kind of how we're trying to help people get to uh, password. This is a, eventually you're gonna have a very, very persistent, calm, long living password. This is what we have in Microsoft right now. We have a one year password policy now. We got there. And uh, what we're really relying on is the fact that we don't even use it. We come in, I don't use it day to day at all. I don't know what uh, uh, you might, but for um, uh, for me personally, I have not used my actual password to log into anything for over a year now. Um, I only use it to reset my password, to change it every year. <laughs> So this is how we got there. Uh, we're not quite passwordless. As we're not, you're not truly passwordless until the DC does not accept the password for you. We uh, are we going to get there with 2019 AD or not? I don't know. I have my doubts personally. I think there's a lot of things tied to the password hash and the NTLM hash, all that stuff. Um, Kerberos is a fairly um, password um, bound um, protocol, but. Um, I think we're definitely going to get them in the cloud first. So 
my suggestion, and if you're trying to be passwordless as a company, see how fast you can get to the cloud. Because I do think um, you will be able to get in the cloud to passwordless before on-premises for AD. Awesome. We had two other questions um, real quickly. The next was, can you set limited access on Microsoft Teams as well? <clears throat> mm -hmm. So Teams is, uh, first of all, yes, we recently added it as a direct service you can target, as opposed to Teams is uh, peculiar for those who don't uh, uh, grab the uh, underlying question of the question. Teams really doesn't technically have a back end per se as much as because it really reaches across to SharePoint and Exchange and uh, Skype for Business back end to get a lot of the stuff, you know, your presence, your meetings, uh, stores the uh, under the hood. The team is really an office group with a bunch of things in it. Uh, files are stored in SharePoint, so you could per perceive that Teams technically doesn't have a back end, but if you try to govern it that way, it suffers a lot. Like if you try to say, okay, I'm going to go require MFA on Exchange, and I'm going to go require MFA on SharePoint, and I'm going to go require device access on Skype, then Teams suffers significantly because then it has to satisfy all these different conditions. So I think we've recently added Teams as an actual service and app you can target in conditional access. And um, we're doing work with the Teams team in general so that um, uh, with the Office teams in general, we're trying to get to a place where we move you away from this whole target by service thing because Office itself is evolving. For those of you, your listeners who don't know, um, there is common shared storage between Office teams that they want to get to, right? They'd love, for example, for your user profile picture to be in one place. So if it's if it's in one place, let's say it's stored in some common uh, office storage place, which CA policy hits it? Does that mean if you're trying to get to your profile picture from an app and there's a SharePoint MFA policy, do you get MFA on the way to the profile picture, right? Uh, if, what if you're coming from Exchange when you have a device compliance access on Exchange policy on Exchange, does that cause you to require device access uh, check on <coughs> profile picture access? It's, it becomes messy. So <coughs> we're trying to build um, a more cohesive way of describing conditional access policy specifically for Office, especially for those shared resources between services. Um, we're not quite there yet, but for now, to answer the short answer to the questioner's question is, yes, Teams is targetable now in CA. Awesome. And the last one, before we move on, um, they said, we use Improvada. Are you looking uh, at possibly providing badge tap as another factor for authentication? Currently, it is used for lock and unlock of physical systems and to transfer desktops via VDI sessions? Um, yes, short answer is yes. We are looking into that. Um, uh, we're trying to make that work specifically for our healthcare customers where um, there are some uh, early conversations we're having with and provider and providers like this as well. Awesome. Cool. That's it for the questions for right now. Sure. So I wanted to pitch two things. Um, this slide, just to help the listeners um, uh, and the viewers kind of see um, the power. This is kind of next generation identity provider. Um, this is not to brag, sorry, or boast. This is simply saying you should expect this of any identity provider. This is going to be how they all should function. Um, um, in the future is they all should be doing something like this. So the, this slide is talking about the intelligent graph. Um, and this is this does strongly favor Microsoft to be um, perfectly honest. Um, as a result of you know clever design or brilliant acquisitions or sheer luck, but we do run all these properties, right? We run one of the biggest consumer email services. We run one of the biggest consumer identity services. We run one of the biggest cloud compute providers. Azure, one of the biggest search engines being one of the biggest, uh, what do you call it, um, SaaS apps, Office 365, and so on. We run obviously one of the biggest OS installations, Windows. So each of these gives us, um, initially it was simply a lot of burden, a lot of noise, right? So basically the Azure guys are being hacked all the time, the Xbox guys are being hacked all the time, the Hotmail guys. And we realized shortly, as our own team started talking to each other, that the bad guys live in the seams. 
So there may be a bad guy in Azure who actually signed up with a Hotmail account. There may be a bad guy in Xbox who was also, uh, uh, sorry, I don't know, there may be a spammer in, in, Hot, in Hotmail who was also a gamer in Xbox. <laughs> And so we started to realize that the bad guys are living between the seams. They may, they may steal a credit card from an Xbox user and then use it in an Azure subscription and so forth. And so we started to actually stitch this information together to kind of, okay, who are the known bot networks attacking Exchange Online? Okay, these, you know, bazillion IPs. Can we share that with the, the Azure team so that when they start seeing those bots attacking them, they know that they're bots, right? So sharing signal between our own services and then learning and um, um, sharing, you know, between our teams has made us um, stronger. And I think um, more and more, obviously, the big players are also Google is doing similar things and Amazon is doing similar things because um, it's just we realize the bad guys live in these teams. If, if our own teams don't talk to each other, and don't share a signal, we're going to be uh, out the best thing attacking ourselves, right? Bad guys are going to use uh, a fake subscription with Azure to spin up Azure VMs to attack Exchange Online. <laughs> we have to be very careful uh, with <coughs> our own stuff. But this also gives you as the customer a lot of uh, much more improved signals. So if you use our security graph, you'll be able to say, well, can you find me all the risk events of this uh, user? OK, there was this risky event. Here's the IP address. Can I go look up this IP address against the botnet? Uh, you know, graph query. Can I also query the Windows Defender ATP to see if uh, this IP tried to, uh, if there was anybody trying to beam anything to this IP from my, inside my corporate network, right? Now we can start making all these intelligent queries and understanding deeply how the bad guys are moving in your system. And so um, that's the first part. That's the security graph. Um, the second part, I'm going to switch to a different deck that has uh, a deeper explanation of our machine learning and risk scoring stuff. So this is a kind of a high level explanation of our identity protection engine that is at um, inside our conditional access engine. So um, over here, you've got your Joe user trying to authenticate. And as you can see, uh, is it Schrodinger's user? Is he the user or is not the user? We don't know. Again, this is past credentials. So the fact that he has your password is irrelevant. <laughs> we know, I mean, it's, it's, it's good that he has the password and we won't let him in if he doesn't, but if he does, that's, that's just the beginning point of us evaluating who this person is. And so we factor in, we have a classifier that looks at the user about 100 plus factors about this login. Time of day, type of app, behavior, um, user agent, profile, browser, machine, all this stuff. So we're looking at all these things and trying to figure out, is this you or typically you, or is this does not match typically you? And the machine, this, this used to be a, this is an algorithm. So this is a machine, um, it's going to make a prediction. It's going to say, okay, it looks like it's you. And it's going to let you in. <clears throat> After it lets you in, we have all these feedback channels. We've got tons of logs in our own system, 10 plus terabytes of log. We've got relying parties. So as I mentioned, uh, as an IDP, we're fortunate that we feed a lot of our own services. So we are, we're the only IDP that Office and Azure accepts tokens from. And a lot of our Microsoft first party apps, they all use us. And so they give us feedback. They say, hey, this guy you let in yesterday, he came into Exchange Online and he created a mailbox and he started spamming other people. Um, okay, now we know. Uh, Self-reporting, right? So we may have blocked you and then you called help, uh, help desk or we may have let you in and then after we let you in, um, you went to your activity log or your admin saw a sign in from uh, some faraway country and said, no, that wasn't you, right? And then um, threat data. So we get a feed from Windows Defender and from Azure Security Center, from other systems that tell us about bad actors and bad IPs and botnets and all that stuff. And then we analyze uh, your behavior after you came in and we say, okay, typically you came in and you, you know, clicked on these three SaaS apps and you did these five things and you go home after that. And this time you did seven different, completely different things. Maybe that wasn't you. And then we go back and we basically judge, you know, uh, the actual call. We say, okay, that was a true negative or a true positive, or a false negative or a false positive. And then we feed that back to our uh, machine learning algorithm. We analyze and we, do, uh, we fix the algorithm and then we deploy again. Now, the cool thing about this is, this is how it should work, right? But the cool thing is that this whole cycle 
happens in a day and we can even make it happen three times a day. This used to be a week and a month. Initially, when we would make this analysis, you know, the analysis part used to be human beings looking at every false and, you know, every shady signal we got back and we say, okay, well, where did we go wrong and analyze, <coughs> update the algorithm and then push this out, you know, on a new build weekly or monthly to production. Now all of this is automated on a daily basis. The machine is learning itself. The, the algorithm is, is is learning by itself from people's um, actions or inactions. And this brings us back to the point I made at the beginning about the 10 billion logins a day or 8 billion logins a day. Your, your best machine learning algorithm is only as good as a training set, right? So you can have the smartest algorithm in the world and then train it with just seven users and it's going to become stupid because you just, it's, it's only going to solve, for, it's only going to be able to predict those seven users and that's it. But if you have a large training set and your algorithm becomes very, very clever about the nuances between uh, what a good login looks like and what a bad login looks like. And so this is why the, um, the uh, large market share and wide adoption of Azure AD is important because we don't think, and this is, um, um, this is not to make a plug for a product, we do not think the identity provider of the future can keep up with the human analysts. We made all this work. This, we used to have a bunch of analysts doing this manually. We just discovered they can't keep up. And so we've learned this years ago and we've moved on from that. And we don't think that any um, world class, you know, enterprise identity provider can keep up by having, oh, I'm going to have a security, a bunch of security experts looking at my data mining, my offline data and figuring out, oh, three days ago, Tim, when he logged in, it wasn't really Tim. Well, that's kind of too late. Uh, I'm sure most of your listeners are familiar with the fact that on premises, when, when customers get compromised, on average, the bad guy is in there for 70 days now. That's that's much improved from the 210 days it was four years ago. <laughs> they used to sit there for a long time, uh, like, uh, what is it, like eight months or seven months. Now they're only in for two and a half months, but that's still a whole lot of time before they're caught. And so um, we don't think humans can, and that's just because on premises, most of the systems are human, right? People have the typical setup, right? They have a data mining application of some sort. They, they dump all their the logs in there, everything, and then they run some data mining tool. And <clears throat> usually it's a post-mortem, like a bad guy has been caught somehow, and then they go back in the look at the logs and they're like, oh, see, oh, there he is. I see when he came in. And so, um, we don't think that's clever enough and fast enough for the types of attacks the world is seeing right now. And it used to be, I mean, people think that hacking is such a difficult thing and such a complicated thing. For 50 bucks, you can get on the black market and you can buy a tool that will password spray um, any endpoint you give it. And it will. It comes with a dictionary, the bad password, the known passwords already. And it comes even with an 800 number. You can call them and they will actually support you if you have problems with the tool. And so um, so you don't even have to know software coding. You just need to you just have to have a target and 50 bucks and the tool will do it for you. So and it will simply breeze through all the username possibilities and you tell it how uh, what the password, what the username range you want to try is and it will actually either randomly try usernames or actually pick from a list of usernames you give it. And then it will just try all kinds of passwords and it has and it can try them uh, vertically or horizontally, meaning that try the same, try all passwords against some one guy or try the first password against everybody. And then so that it doesn't get doesn't cause lockout. So that's how sophisticated the bad guys are. And this is the cheap end of the bad guys, not even the high end. So um, with that, with those kind of capabilities, relying on offline after the fact data mining of by human beings to catch them, we feel is not adequate enough given where we're at. And so that's another message I want to leave your listeners with is um, when you move into the cloud and as you move to the cloud, make sure you have something like this. Shift your mindset from the offline data mining. My sock is going to look at the stuff, you know, after the fact to see if there was a bad guy to something that at least at runtime does some kind of risk detection and mitigation. And so, um, and I'm pausing, I will think about five minutes, I want to make sure if there, I want to see if there are other questions. Yeah, we had uh, Cedric posted one and he asked, he said, one of the issues 
we have with CA is B2B support. He said, Office 365 partner does not set up the same CA as we do. For example, they do not require MFA to 365 where we do. When they connect to our SharePoint, access is denied since they do not get prompted for the MFA. Will Microsoft be improving B2B CA related issues? So, so the, can you read the last part again? So when they're sure. coming to Microsoft? He says, so, for example, they do not require MFA to Office 365, whereas we do. Mm -hmm. When they connect to our SharePoint, access is denied since they do not get prompted for MFA. And he said, well, we've been improving if that. This is perhaps a older attempt because right now the way B2B works is if you're not required to MFA in your home tenant, that's fine but then you come across to somebody else's tenant to access SharePoint or Exchange. If that SharePoint, um, if that customer has a requiring MFA for SharePoint, you will be prompted for MFA. And if you don't have MFA set up and you don't have um, the licenses for it, we will proof you up in the new tenant. In fact, we will not actually use the fact that you've had MFA done in your home tenant at all. So right now we don't even trust it. So even if you had an MFA claim in your home tenant, meaning you did MFA coming to your tenant, when you're coming to my tenant and I have an MFA policy on my app, you will be asked to MFA again because the MFA claim does not carry over across tenants. So we will actually ask you for it. I'm, not, I'm wondering if this is an old attempt. I don't know if Cedric can actually provide a uh, on the fly feedback, but um, right now that should not be the case. We sh you should actually be prompted for MFA again, and if you don't have MFA set up, it will actually help you set it up with, you know, ask you for the phone number and uh, finish the text or whatever. And um, yeah, it, I'm, uh, that's not how it should be working today. But I'm happy also to follow up offline. Like, I mean, if, if you can maybe connect offline, you and I, Mike, maybe we can reach out to Cedric and, and find it. Awesome. Um, that's all the questions that we did. I have a couple of comments earlier, just to let you know. Mm -hmm. People, really liked the fact that you have the, when you're running PowerPoint, you have the subtitles and there it was kind of an aside just saying, you know, it's great to see use of that. Um, it makes it much more engaging and uh, so people like that. Interesting, I think that's teamed. I don't think it's me, but that's what I'd love to take credit for it. I think <laughs> teams is, and I, I have to say it's, it's uh, it has been a pleasure and a joy to actually watch the company. We're making a huge push in our accessibility stuff, obviously. For those of you who don't know, Satya has a son who has uh, uh, basically special needs, and so yeah. um, he's been pushing the whole company all up. And so this has been ability is huge. Yeah, it's, it's been turned on even in meetings. We've been noticing it ourselves. Yeah. Anyway. And I, as I just thought it was you doing it actually for the. No, record. no, actually, it's in your PowerPoint because it's coming up when you go into present mode. It's running subtitles, so it's subtitles is turned on. But that's cool. It is cool. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, as you can see, the, the push is happening across the company. It's not something I purposefully did for my. I'd like yeah. to take credit, but it's not me. <laughs> awesome. So that's all the questions for right now. Cool. Yeah. So um, I do have to run, but um, this has been great. And all right, if you guys have any follow up questions or uh, for conditional access or any protection or anything like that, I'm more than happy to engage. Yeah, and uh, just so that everybody knows, um, I'm going to push out my screen again. Um, whoops, there we go. So, you know, first of all, Tarek, thank you very much. Feel free to drop off, but it, it is a pleasure having you today. Um, for those of you who are not aware, we have our final session tomorrow guarding the HLS gate or healthcare and life sciences. Again, it pertains to anybody, but uh, we're going to be focusing on that with Microsoft Threat Intelligence. So I have that up here. If you go to techcommunities.microsoft.com and head over to the Healthcare and Life Sciences blog, you'll find the post around this where it has all of those. Um, you can grab the link directly from there. We'll be at 12 noon again, or you can grab the ICS calendar invite. So we're looking forward to uh, concluding and then getting feedback from folks. Um, and I got a comment, just so you know, Tarek, uh, said this guy is really good. So that's awesome. Um, yes, Thank you. And I, I would concur. <laughs> cool. So thumbs up and thank you for today. 
And uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. If you guys have feedback, you know, feel free on our blog. Reach out to me on LinkedIn, on uh, Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram. I'm on all those. But uh, let us know. We're going to be serving up some additional focused sessions. Tarek just dropped, so I can keep talking for a few minutes. Um, but uh, thank you, Michael. Um, another one saying great session. We're looking to provide ongoing some, you know, we did this for a week. It was kind of a trial to see how people liked it, how they responded. We've had great feedback around this. Uh, a lot of customers have been tuning in uh, around this as well as others. So what we'd like to do, and I'm, I'm targeting looking at some doing, I call them days. So I might have SharePoint days where two, three, four days, maybe the whole week. Again, run sessions like we did at 12 o'clock, possibly 90 minutes. Um, but uh, run those where we'll dive into a particular theme, SharePoint one week. Maybe we do Teams days and we do Teams. Maybe we do Office. I had somebody asking about that and other subject areas. So if you have areas of interest, let me know. Would love to grab those. Um, we're going to be teeing those up for the second half of this calendar year. And with that, Tarek had to drop. Uh, he was he was a, uh, a substitute, and I think we were really lucky to get him. Um, the rest of the team got double booked, and uh, at the last minute, he stepped up, and I'm very thankful again to Tarek. So, again, thank you for everybody who tuned in today. Uh, tune in tomorrow, 12 noon Eastern, for the last of our five sessions on guarding the HLS gate with Microsoft Threat Intelligence. This has been Mike Giannotti with Tarek. Daoud and bidding you have a great take care and as always, ciao.